Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Hello everybody, welcome to Talking Tendons Podcast. My name is Peter Maliaris, I'm a researcher at Monash University. Um, I um, had a great time recently overseas in the UK delivering some courses and also at a conference in Denmark. Um, And I'm back and I'm glad to say I didn't have COVID, but I did come into contact with lots of people who had COVID, which I'm finding really interesting. Uh, perhaps the vaccine is actually working for me. Something's working. Um, I've also got some courses coming up, Mastering Lower Limb Tenopathy courses in Melbourne on uh, June, early June, and in Darwin, which I'm really looking forward to, in uh, July, early July. Uh, just wanted to mention that. So today in the Talking Tendons podcast, I'm going to be talking about wait and see interventions for Achilles tendinopathy. One of the really interesting and important questions that we need to answer is, is this treatment that we're offering people any better than just doing nothing at all, wait and see? Um, And uh, the recent Dutch guideline on Achilles tendinopathy that was led by Robert Jan de Vos and his team in the Netherlands, they they, uh, have uh, some recommendations about wait and see. Uh, what we should inform our patients and basically it um, goes a little something like this that we should inform people that if you have Achilles tendinopathy there's going to be limited improvements over time um, uh, compared to wait and see see policy especially in the short term Uh, and that's based on two studies and I just wanted to draw people's attention to them because they are quite useful if you've got patients you might want to um, and they ask you about wait and see, you might want to provide this evidence to them or at least a summary of it. But there are two studies. There's one by Hortz, Hortzman uh, that was published in uh, 2013 and there's one by Romper that was published in 2007. And they're both comparing wait and see to exercise for mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, so why is wait and see comparison important? Well, it's important because it's controlling for things like natural history, uh, and that is, um, um, you know, uh, will this condition just get better if I do nothing at all? And some people do want to take that chance and may want to think, I'm just going to let this let this go. And I, you know, and I think all of us have done that at some point, had some sort of painful condition and thought, you know what, it's going to go away. And a lot of the time, it does go away. But uh, what we're finding with Achilles tendinopathy is that it may not go away. And that's certainly the recommendation from this Dutch guideline. So the, so it's an important, it is an important question to answer for patients um, uh, because um, uh, they'll, often, they'll often wonder and they'll often think, can I just let this go? Now, an important thing to consider is what are the populations in these studies? And, uh, you know, like most studies, they will recruit people who have got, who have had the pain for a certain amount of time. So we don't know about the acute or the sort of short-term um, pain uh, in the mid-portion Achilles. How how likely that is to go away by itself? It may be that it does, and I'm sure it does for many people. But when you've had it for a few weeks, both of these studies tend to suggest that. Um, it's not going to go away by itself. It's at least in the short term in the first, I think the outcomes are up to four months for the Romper study. And in the other study by Hortzman, I think they might be 12 weeks. Uh, Yes, 12 weeks. So it's a bit shorter. So um, yeah, so it's not going to go away in the short term. Um, if you've got a chronic Achilles mid-portion problem, you may want to do something about it. Um, and what they show in both of these studies is that compared to, say, exercise, there's not as much benefit. Uh, in fact, they've still got pretty moderate disability, whereas the people who 
uh, do the exercise over over a number of weeks tend to um, improve and have uh, substantial improvements that are that are better uh, uh, between group compared to the wait and see after that exercise okay so that's a really good thing to be able to educate your patients about if they're asking um, and it's it's really it's it's good evidence that our exercise interventions are worthwhile in this in this context for this population now one thing i did want to also mention during this podcast briefly is that um, you do need to make clear what wait and see is so when you're reading these studies uh, wait and see may sound like it's quite standardized you just wait and you you see what happens over time but actually there's a bit more to it than that um, in the romper study they actually provided uh, they saw an orthopedic surgeon um, and um, the orthopedic surgeon provided uh, training modification advice implementation of stretching advice ergonomic advice so there was a fair bit of advice there and also advice about taking anti-inflammatories and pain medications if needed um, so so that's that's important to bear in mind the uh, horseman study was uh, slightly different uh, in their study uh, wait and see was more of wait and see so basically they um, they got them to fill out an activity or training log uh, and that was it okay so they they basically didn't give them any advice or anything, anything, anything like that. Um, so wait and see. Uh, in summary, does seem to be benef- does seem to be less effective than uh, than doing exercise. Both both the studies used um, uh, eccentric exercise as the comparator. There's also a third arm. If you read the studies, you'll see there's a third arm, which is vibration training for the Horseman study and um, shockwave for the romper study i'll link both of these studies to the um to the actual notes for this um, podcast so you'll have both of those and you can read them i recommend you have a look at them yourself um, and and just lastly the the other thing we can ask ourselves is um what about um uh what about bias with a wait and see intervention um, and that's one of the things that it has been uh, criticized for so when you're doing a wait and see intervention um, you're generally not able to blind uh, the participants because they know they're not receiving anything um, and uh, that might uh, therefore influence the outcomes um, and also the people that are receiving a treatment know that there's another group who's not and that might influence their outcomes so so there certainly is Um, bias from that and it's different to say a placebo controlled trial where you might blind participants to if they're getting the actual intervention or not Um, but it's more of a pragmatic trial approach to be thinking about um, giving a wait and see and asking that very pragmatic question of what will be the difference for doing nothing at all Um, so it is a um, it is it is a good question to answer, and as I say, for Achilles tendons, if you do have patients that have Achilles tendonopathy and they're asking, uh, what will happen if I've got this chronic Achilles tendon? I've had it for months, and it uh, will it go away by itself? The answer is probably not in the short term. Excellent. Thank you very much for listening to that brief podcast. As I say, I'll link the I'll link the DeVos management um, guidelines because that's a really good read as well. Um, all 291 pages I believe of that guideline I'll I'll link all those to this uh, podcast thank you very much for listening see you next time love this podcast Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.